Professor Dr. M. Srinivas, sir, Director, Ancient Delhi, Professor Dr. K. K. Varma, sir, Dean Academics, Ames New Delhi, and Ms. Michelle Lang Ali, Director, Office of Health at USAID India, to kindly take your seats on the stage. I would like to request our esteemed director, sir, to deliver the welcome address. Thank you. Uh, well, we just welcomed him there, and we'll welcome again, okay. Professor of Surgery, Professor of Literature, Professor, Professor of Public Health. And I can add on that. And, and uh, it's a, uh, an opportunity for all of us to listen to him. I think we'll go straight away with his talk and his decisions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I request Professor Dr. K. K. Verma, Dean Academics, East New Delhi, to introduce our esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Atul Gawande. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, our very distinguished, renowned, and well-known guest speaker, Dr. Atul Gawande, who has just been introduced a few minutes back uh, during the release of this uh, document for uh, the preparedness infection control and waste management. I am told he is uh, an endocrine surgeon, but apart from the endocrine surgery, he has set the endocrine marks in so many other areas, almost everywhere. Uh, you talk about and uh, he is there, but currently he is the assistant administrator for global health at USAID where he, I'm told, oversees the bureau which manages the funds of over four billion US dollars and the staff of over 900 people who are working in the area of uh, equitable value of public health approaches around the world. The Global Health Bureau focuses on the work that improves life everywhere from preventing child and maternal deaths to controlling the HIV aid epidemic, combating infection and preparing for the future outbreak. Prior to joining the uh, current Wyden Harris administration, he was a practicing surgeon at Brigham and Women Hospital and professor at Harvard Medical School and also at Harvard Chan School of Public Health. He was the founder and chair of the Adrian Lab as Joint Center for Health System Innovation and of Lifebox in non-profit making surgery safer globally. From 2018 to 2020, he was also the CEO of, uh, I think, a number of companies, which included uh, Amazon, Haven, Boxshine, and several others. Atul was also a lifetime staff writer for New York New Yorker magazine and has written four New York Times best-selling books, uh, one of which he has just now gifted to our uh, Honorable Director, Dr. Srinivas, which is the Checklist Manifesto. And all of his books are uh, the best-sellers uh, even till now. So uh, I have the honor to welcome Dr. Atul 
to this uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences and to this function. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the warm welcome. And uh, I don't know if we can show the slides. OK, thank you. So I'm going to start here at Ames in my discussion about lessons for life expectancy. I came for my first visit to Ames 21 years ago when I was a uh, I was coming as a brand new faculty member. I had just finished my surgery residency. You got very few moments in life where you can take a little time, and the end of surgery residency is one of those moments <laughs> where I took three months to come to India, and I wanted to start at Ames, where you have set and advanced the health of India for many decades. You've played a critical role in transformation. And so this was the picture I took in July of 2023, walking to the entrance of Ames. And this was the first thing I saw. <laughs> the monkeys of Ames. <laughs> I don't know if you have those anymore. <laughs> um, I was going to spend those three months in multiple hospitals, and I was starting at the top. My mother's from Ahmedabad, my father's from Maharashtra, in a village in Yotmal district. And so I went to Nagpur first, well, after Ames, where I spent a couple of weeks. I then spent almost a month in Nagpur at the medical school of my father, who became a surgeon, trained as a physician in the early 1960s. So as an observer here, and then as an observer there, and then I went to Nanded, the closest district hospital to the village where my father came from and spend another couple of weeks as an observer. And then in the cottage hospital and primary health center in Umarked, the closest town to where my father's village was. I don't have that many pictures I found of Ames. It was all pictures of cases. I think for a large public audience, I might not show the pictures, but I will show one. This was an indication of the kind of disease that you manage on a regular basis here, the kind of which I had rarely seen. This is a desmoid tumor in a 14-year-old wrapped around the mesentery. And so many things that first day I'm seeing cases like this. Number one, wearing chuppels in the operating room. <laughs> Number two, the advancement of disease seen here. Number three, the skills that people were bringing. I'd never seen complex laparoscopic cases such as simple laparoscopic management of perforated ulcers. But that's because we would see so few perforated ulcers in the US. Here, there were two, three perforated ulcer cases per day back then, where still basic ranitidine was not readily available. I would follow a career path. It was 2003, and I had just published my first book, Complications, in 2002. And I could come here and just be with you. I learned the secret. After 3 o'clock, the, the professors would leave and the residents would take over. And so I always made sure to stick around with the residents into the evening who were uh, so welcoming and so wonderful to get to operate and, uh, and, and learn together. I would end up having a multi-pronged career to my own surprise, one of writing, one of a surgical oncology career, in particular around endocrine tumors. And then along the way, I also got my master's in pub public health. And I ended up starting a different kind of laboratory. The 
the puzzle to me that was so exemplified by what I saw here was we had had a century of breakthrough transformation. Transformation that here you can see we had since 1950 enabled an 80-year life expectancy in the highest income countries in the world. But we had not matched that set of discoveries and that commitment to research for breakthrough innovations with a similar commitment to research and discovery in follow-through innovations. How do we make that capability become possible for everybody in the world? And so I would gradually end up developing a laboratory that first would look to see what kinds of innovations, such as a surgery checklist, could we develop that would enable teams in every part of the world to get top of the world results everywhere. We would then expand that work into childbirth, into primary care, and even into care for people at the end of life. The critical part of this work was systems change, changes in processes, and understanding how to make it easier, faster, better, and more scalable, achieving the kinds of outcomes we were seeing in not just the highest income parts of, of the world, but often in the highest income parts of every country. Within the United States, there are wide gaps in the actual care that people receive. And in fact, the differences between countries are not as great as the differences within countries. And that's what I could see in traveling the entire health system in India from Ames to Yotmal and seeing the differences in difficulty of replicating that same quality of care, that same access to technology, that same opportunity to benefit from breakthrough and innovation. I would end up founding during COVID a public benefit corporation in the United States in order to try to en enable scale in COVID, enabling ways to bring diagnostics to every part of the United States when infection broke out in the US, eventually how to bring uh, bringing teams that enabled vaccination in large parts of the United States, and then enabling children to return to schools by having testing in schools in the United States. That led to uh, work as a COVID advisor as the, after President Biden was elected to office. They call it the transition, the period between election and taking office, and I became a transition advisor for COVID. And then not long after that, I was asked to lead global health at USAID. The bureau that I inherited, as was mentioned, has 900 people in DC. We work with 1,700 uh, health officers in, uh, in offices around the world, in 80 office, offices in 80 countries around the world, working on addressing maternal child health and nutrition, addressing infectious diseases such as HIV, TB, malaria, addressing outbreaks. And at the time I was playing, I, was, I had joined to play a role on international response to COVID and on preventing pandemics and being able to respond. At the center of our work was the, the commitment to health equity, to a goal in global health that we don't define very well what we mean by health equity. But here's what I think it means. It means that this life expectancy that's available to those who have the advantages of living in, in places that can offer the full set of capabilities can be provided to everybody. Now, this is a tall task. During the last century, we discovered 70,000 different conditions, 70,000 different ways that the human body can fail. And for those conditions, we've developed 19,000 approved drugs, 4,000 
medical and surgical procedures. An unenumerated by, I estimate, to be as many as a thousand public health interventions that have meaningful, significant value in people's lives. That has enabled a lifespan that is over 80 years on average, if you have access to that capability. And so our job has become to deploy those discoveries in the right way, at the right time, town by town, to every person alive. I've argued it is the most ambitious thing human beings have ever attempted to do, to double the species lifespan, double our own lifespan. Achieving the kinds of results that USA, Europe, Australia was achieving, is achieving at 80 years, seemed a far off prospect. Countries that have achieved it have been ones that have achieved high income wealth. Japan got there and exceeded US life expectancy. 85 years, the highest survival in the world for a population. Korea is almost at that level. All of them only achieved it. Another one is Singapore. They only achieved it when they became high income countries, rich countries. China is now a high income country and is only now arriving at a 78 year life expectancy. And so the question is, if our job is to enable true equity, then that means being able to make health truly scalable. Can it reach people without having to become rich? Can we achieve this life expectancy with a middle income country or even a lower middle income country? That seemed impossible, but in the last 10, 15 years, we've seen what I've called the surprise. I came into this role and I realized I get to be part of a living experiment. USAID has been around since 1961, partnering with low income countries as they advanced to become middle income countries and beyond. And with more than 60 countries in the world where we have been doing this work as partners in developing health, developing, uh, developing solutions around malnutrition, developing better sanitation and public health capability, we've been able to see that a few have, have advanced faster than the others. And what we found is that over the last decade in particular, there are some partner countries of USAID that came to match or even exceed US lifespan without becoming, before they became, high income countries, while they became middle income countries. We have examples such as Chile at 81 years life expectancy, higher than the United States. Costa Rica at 80 years, Thailand at 80 years, and Sri Lanka, which has now reached 77 years, barely making it above a low income threshold and struggling economically, and yet continually improving towards this level of survival. And one of the things we're seeing is that countries are managing to match or exceed US life expectancy on as little as $300 per person per year for healthcare, as is being achieved in Thailand. Well, in the United States, we're spending $12,000 per year for healthcare. How are they doing this? One of the key measures that I've come to recognize as being important and helps communicate to our own teams what our goals are is that success in achieving long life expectancy requires success, success in reducing the percentage of deaths in any country that occur before the age of 50. 
what we've called our premature mortality index. In many of these countries, you can see they had started out in the 1960s at over 50% of deaths occurring before the age of 50. In fact, in low-income countries in 1960, you had more than 50% of deaths occurring in children before the age of five. And child mortality was the very first area that public health focused on reducing. But as time went on and it became the 1970s and the 1980s and 1990s, child mortality was reducing, but you were having death in young adulthood. Deaths before people had had that chance to contribute. Deaths of young people before they'd had the chance to raise their families. Deaths before they had a chance to make a country more prosperous. And that's where we came and understand that health and prosperity have, have had to be hand in hand. The United States has reached 9% of our deaths occurring before the age of 50. But Europe is averaging 5% of deaths occurring before the age of 50. In Japan, in Korea, less than 2% of deaths occur before the age of 50. That means we have discovered the capabilities to make death before 50 rare. There are wide global disparities in our occurrence of death before the age of 50. We have closed the gap in substantial ways of having um, our, our deaths due to infectious disease in childhood thanks to vaccines, thanks to um, uh, improvements in nutrition, even though those jobs are not done. But what's emerged is a persistent wide gap in the likelihood you will die before you are in middle age. Africa, 60% of people will die before the age of 50 at the present time. The world average, and I'll point out the Indian average, is 25% of deaths occur before the age of 50. So then the question is, what are those outliers doing, those countries that are beating their income? And the answer is a consistent demonstration that they are making death rare before 50 by prioritizing public health and primary health care, I should say. The role of primary health care in delivering essential services and improving mortality has been proven in numerous settings now, including in randomized trials. In the Navrongo trial in Ghana in the late 1990s, which USAID helped partner in, involved providing villages with a salaried community nurse who had primary health care training across integrated services from family planning to malaria to birth services and beyond, plus having community outreach workers visiting every household at least once every three months. And the results of that were increased immunization, increased use of facilities for childbirth, increased use of child illness services, better contraception, and the result was a 50% reduction in child mortality within three years and a 70% reduction in child mortality in seven years. In Ethiopia, they were able to scale this kind of program in the much heralded health extension program that put community health nurses, 30,000, as they were called, health extension workers, to deliver basic services through 18,000 health posts and home outreach on a national scale and achieved a two-thirds drop in under five mortality. Now that's at the very poorest end of the scale and starting at some of the lowest uh, life expectancies to begin with. But we've also seen in places that were achieving already high results, getting extraordinary improvements from the same 
rollout. Costa Rica in 1995 had already achieved a life expectancy with that kind of basic infrastructure. In, uh, uh, they'd achieved a 75-year life expectancy at that point, and then they began a rollout of a World Bank-supported health reform that established comprehensive primary health care, not just for the uh, maternal and child needs, but across the life course. Comprehensive, continuous, and coordinated primary care. When they started their universal health care coverage program and had limited money, they did not start with hospital coverage. They started with universal primary care and comprehensive services. And it had a very similar design to what I just talked about in Ghana. It integrated the services, public health, preventive, and curative, in community-based primary clinics. It empaneled people, meaning everybody in a community belonged to a place that would be their default source of care. And they established teams, they called them Ebais teams, with multidisciplinary capabilities and regular home-based outreach. They visited each, every home at least yearly, typically about every three months. And for those at risk, they would visit as often as every, twice a week. They rolled this program out community by community in a staggered fashion, which allowed it to be a natural experiment that was recently published uh, with an analysis that compared the communities as they rolled out with the ones that had not had the rollout yet. And what they found was a 13% further reduction in already a low mortality over nine years, mainly reducing inequities in the country which had already start, when they'd already started with a 75-year average life expectancy. The biggest reductions were in non-communicable diseases and in elderly mortality. And they saw that people, as these services became more prevalent, sought care at primary clinics and fewer sought care in emergency rooms. Thailand has stuck out for me because of how they've achieved it. At a, at a low level of cost. I had a chance to visit their program. And one of the things that you got to see was that in 2002, they instituted their universal health care reform. Their universal health care reform started with a guarantee of primary health care coverage and investments in primary care to ensure that they had uh, both outreach and comprehensive nurse-based services. They started, just like their peers, uh, at a 35% death rate, very similar to Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, and I think I have a pointer, maybe not. Well, you can see the black line at the top is India, which by by 2000 was closer to almost 50% of deaths being at less than 50 as it came down to 25% of deaths in India at, uh, at 50 years of age. That is very similar to where Philippines is, very similar to where Indonesia is, but Thailand has now approached the U.S. level of, uh, of death before 50. And the key was being able to see what the primary health care design was. I visited a, uh, a peri-urban area called, in, uh, called Bung Ito, Thailand. And here we were in the primary health center. They had, uh, this was a primary health center serving a community of 34,000 different neighborhoods and villages. They had, uh, here you can see the uh, OPD for primary health care, they had uh, imaging, they had dental services, they had packages for comprehensive uh, non-communicable disease services, and it was free under the pe for people under who have the UHC scheme, which had been universalized. They provided a team of a family physician, nurses, dentists, 
and a pharmacist for each 10,000 people. But the secret weapon, what made this powerful, was they had the village health workers and a village supervisor who would go out and make the visits to the homes, one million for a population of 7 million, 70 million people. That meant that they, you could have one community health volunteer for every 20 people and a supervisor for every 10 who would spend full time supervising these part-time people who would make visits at least a few hours a week visiting the different houses and neighborhoods, doing preventive education, but making sure that no one was missed who had their health care needs. And you could see the difference. Thailand had a surge in the availability of essential health services. The Universal Health Coverage Index is an index measured by the WHO of 14 indicators. Those 14 indicators include uh, TB diagnosis rates, childhood immunization, malaria, HIV, contraception, and so on. Also, uh, hypertension management, smoking cessation, and included um, one measure of healthcare worker density. And where they started with their colleagues, with their peers, and also with India, in, uh, in the year 2000, this program they instituted surged their levels so they really were getting to the same levels of health provision as we see in the highest income country in the world. And here you see what it meant. 99% of newborns protected against tetanus, meeting contraceptive needs, meeting prenatal care, but then also getting to not perfect, but much higher effective treatment coverage than their peers. They eliminated malaria from 87% of their districts. In the last year, they've had only six t uh, deaths from malaria. We, in my role at USAID, I've argued that our chance, that, that we are learning from these countries that the core scaffolding for long life is your primary health care center. That scaffolding that provides long life requires a nurse at the front line at the community level and enough nurses to reach the populations that are there. And you need the outreach workers. You don't wait in the clinic to find people. One person here told me, they call it, instead of patient-initiated care, you pair that with system-initiated care to catch people before they are sick or when they're starting to be sick and are being neglected by doing that visit to the households and directing them to the services that they need. And that saves and extends lives. We created a program called Primary Impact that partnered initially with seven countries that were seeking to radically reorient their systems around primary care. Five countries included Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, and in Asia, the Philippines and Indonesia, which was seeking to catch up and recognize how to get to that 80-year life expectancy. The causes of deaths in these countries, and I've added India in, in here, because I'm hoping India can become our USAID partner country for primary impact as well. You've seen, you're seeing in these countries that the still traditional focus areas like tuberculosis, HIV, malaria, maternal and child health conditions are coming down, but still a large portion of deaths. But as you see in India, in Asia especially, the non-communicable diseases are now the biggest drivers of death, major contributors. And so primary health has to accommodate and enable that work. Now, I came on this trip uh, with USAID because I'm extraordinarily excited about what Ayushman Bharat is doing. Uh, your colleague, uh, Vinod Paul, I got to spend time with him, a central architect of this plan. 
And Ayushman Bharat replicates this concept that has been deployed at small scale in countries around the world, whether it's Ghana or Thailand, much smaller places. And it's taking it on and demonstrating that you can create this capability in the biggest country in the world and learn how to scale it. Here you see that India has made big progress in the, in the maternal and child health indicators. There are still areas for catch up, such as prenatal care coverage, such as tuberculosis effective treatment, such as getting to the finish line and eliminating malaria. But then it is paired with those needs to close gaps in NCDs. And so I got a chance to, oops, and it didn't quite come across, but this is, uh, I spent a day in Indore, in Madhya Pradesh, and then going to sub-centers outside the city. Uh, here, this one is in Dharampur, Dharampuri, Madhya Pradesh. And the, I got a chance to really accompany Rashmi Pandey, the CHO, a BSc trained nurse who has come into this role and been in this center that has been transformed from a subcenter PHC to now a health and wellness subcenter, bringing on the packages for NCD coverage along with the, uh, the child health services. And what I wanted to see is how real is what India is doing? How much of a difference can you really make at such impossible scale? And here she is seeing a, a woman for her care in urgent care. And you see already some significant things I want you to notice. The computer system, the two women who have smartphones on a regular basis. And the fact that this, this was, I'd spent many years here working in public health, doing partnership. I see some of you I partnered with in the Better Birth Program in Uttar Pradesh. And we almost never saw a smartphone in the hands of villagers. The clinicians, yes, the villagers, no. But that transformation has, has opened up a platform the second significant thing I saw is that, the, is that uh, Rashmi Pandey knew every ASHA worker. She was genuinely supervising the ASHA workers. Previously when I had come, the ASHA workers were very disconnected from the primary health centers. They did, not, they did not have the supervision so that if there's a TB patient, you knew that they had been put on treatment and could check whether they're staying on the treatment. At this particular center, we had pioneered uh, a set of work that the Indian government requested to develop some protocols to teach a family member how to check and maintain that, that, a, that a family member with TB is staying on their medications, that the ASHA worker can help educate and check on, the, on them, and that the CHO would supervise that the ASHA is doing that work. And we could see in the sub-center that this is actually happening, that this is the magic that Thailand had delivered and could be created here. Already, I could see the lessons for the United States. When COVID came, we could not reach all of our elderly population for vaccination because we do not have ASHA workers. We do not have community health workers going door to door and making sure people are receiving their care. And so we had to hire, we had to learn from countries like India. And so we hired 150,000 healthcare workers with President Biden's emergency action plan. And they could go knocking door to door and we reached over 95% of our elderly. Just this past year, we have made it now government policy that for the Medicare and Medicaid program that, uh, that we have, that we will pay for community health workforce in the United States, 
in the United States. That this is an essential component now we've recognized of the platform for living long, healthy life. You need those outreach workers. And then we've also provided the payments so physicians and nurses are supervising and enabling that care. I want to finish with reviewing what was the real test to me. When I go into a primary health center, I always sit down with the health officer and go through the patient registry. And we went through the book for the last week. And what I wanted to see, first of all, if this is truly becoming a comprehensive primary health center, do men come? Primary health centers are typically regarded as only taking care of pregnant women and it's for young children. I never see men in these places. Not true anymore. 40% of the visits in her book were from men coming in. That meant they were not bypassing this center. They saw value and treatment, whether it was a hypertension case, whether it was diabetes, whether it was tuberculosis and a fear or a fear of tuberculosis. There was a, um, a 26 year old male who came in for back pain. She provided initial assessment that it was without neurological difficulties. I'm quizzing her at length. I'm a harsh questioner and she understood how to look for neuro a back pain with a neuro neurological change, which needs more attention and back pain without a neurological change. No neurological change, gave him some ibuprofen, some exercises. He came back now with persistent back pain, and now she has escalated to higher level care and e Sanjeevni for a telemedicine consult. And then I could see telemedicine consultations in the, the next subcenter and, uh, and actually talk to the physician who was providing them to understand what services they provide. These things that you read on paper, you don't believe they can be real, and yet here they were, they were. The moment that stuck out most in my mind um, was that in going through this, I noticed there were five cases circled in the book, and I said, what are these? Oh, these patients had swelling that made me think they have mumps. I took a picture and sent the pictures, and they confirmed that this is pre presumptive mumps. She logged it into a surveillance system that USAID had helped with training to integrate into primary health services. And the district health officer received the alert that this might be a measles outbreak. I mean, sorry, a mumps outbreak. They gave the instructions to do contact tracing in the community. She had a close enough relationship with the Ashes that together they did the contact tracing. They found eight more cases. They then received instruction, shut down the school, and they mounted an emergency response around a local uh, measles, uh, mumps outbreak. This is undoubtedly one of the best centers. We have been partnered there, they're dedicated, but I've been in, in many places seeing what some of the best look like. And this is achieving care at levels that are extraordinary. It may be the best, maybe it's only 5%, but this is where India is going. This is what a large nation, the biggest in the world, can achieve. And it's demonstrating some capabilities that we can learn from in the US and that other countries will learn from. These are the lessons for advancing life expectancy everywhere. I'm so proud to be back at Ames after 21 years. I was just following along as an observer in my chapels. And here today, I feel so lucky to be welcomed by you in this very wonderful and prominent way. Thank you, and I hope you will keep contributing to these follow-through innovations that help India truly achieve that 80-year life expectancy, which it's demonstrating that you can. Thank you.
Thank you so much, sir, for such an informative session. We'll start with our question and answer round. Any questions from the audience? Thank you, Dr. Gawande, for your uh, excellent talk. Your one slide struck me. You compared the coverage rate between uh, Thailand and India. We were not terribly behind. You know, we were as good as Thailand. But our outcomes or, you know, uh, health outcomes are nowhere compared to Thailand. So apart from the, the coverage issue, what is perhaps very important is the quality of care. So you do antenatal care, but we know at many places antenatal care is equivalent to TT injections, not measuring BP or measuring the proteins in the urine, so as to pick up high-risk pregnancies and treat them uh, at the right places. And uh, the quality of care is actually something that requires a robust health system and robust health system in terms of basic simple things meaning you have a health provider everywhere who is trained there is there are basic supplies there are policies protocols uh, and there are connection between different levels of health system perhaps there is a lot that we need to do there thank you thank you for that there is no doubt that quality is the, is, the, is the struggle. Thailand's quality is not perfect. We saw a 67% tuberculosis diagnostic level, and yet getting to 67% has allowed them to significantly reduce their TB burden. They used to be among the highest in the world, and now they're at a, uh, a moderate level, not a low level. Uh, it's the specifics of Able to, able to follow some critical protocols, able to make sure that you're doing the outreach to capture people who are not being pulled into the system. I'm convinced that it's the large number of people who never show up at that primary health center, never come to that hospital until they're too sick to be helped. That is the difference, that ability to have the outreach that touches their home, recognizes you have this cough and fever, you must come and have the care and then that the care can follow those basic protocols. Here, for example, we heard many struggles where the protocols are now well established in many of the public health sector facilities, but less so on the private health sector side, and the need to be able to close some of those gaps. The gaps can be worker staffing, but now resources have increased so that worker availability of working staff is becoming less the problem. It can be lack of technology, the diagnostic capability, and so on, but that is closing. And you have extraordinary advancements in access to specialized advice through telehealth, or as Rashmi uh, demonstrated, simply sending a picture of her case to the district health officer who could say, oh, this is what you're doing. I'm more convinced than anything that it's that third component, the support of supervision at every level, the connection and network and the genuine relationship between the district health officer and the community health officer, the community health officer and the ASHA. And it now looks like a system instead of people all alone. They can provide training, they can provide reinforcement, and guess who's helping the district health officer? It will be the aims of that state. And guess who's helping that aims? The aims of Delhi. When those interconnections happen, you now have system-initiated care and clinicians who are not alone. It is a country that starts to be one team. And that's the remarkable part I saw in Thailand and that I saw in Madhya Pradesh and I saw developing here is that everybody says quality is the problem. It isn't just aims anymore. <laughs> It, it was, Rashmi would say that. 
the, the primary health physician at the next level had said that. Everybody understands this is the struggle, and they're all working to close that gap. Good afternoon. Uh, such a treat to listen to you always. And you, thank you for reminding everyone about Better Birth. Uh, I will take you back to that Better Birth time and what you mentioned and highlighted right now. You highlighted the smartphones. You highlighted some behavioral sciences. And you also at some point highlighted the budget that was given to health overall. Do you have an opinion of those small countries where you showcased success and accelerated success of these three aspects? How much did digital, how much did behavioral, and how much did actually budget allocation go into it? Thank you. It's clear to me there is a relationship between the budget that is devoted to health, the proportion of that budget that is devoted to primary care, and the success of the programs. But it's not linear, and so we're still trying to model out what that relationship is. If you have a poor design of your primary health system to begin with, you don't have your community health workforce like the ASHA workers, but you're putting money in, or you are, have those community health workers, but they're not supervised by your primary health care. You have some basic breakdowns where you can put the money in, but you don't get the results out. It's hard to measure whether you have a system in place. I love this, uh, uh, a, a, an experimental randomized trial. You want to build a car. And you pick all the best components. You're going to have the best uh, engine, so we'll put a Porsche. We'll have the best body, the safest is a Volvo. We're going to have the best brakes from a BMW. You put it all together and what do you get? A very expensive pile of junk that doesn't go anywhere. But, you know, a well put together mid-range can be reliable, get you great results and take you everywhere you need to go. And so there's detecting that you actually have a system is that the parts are linked together. And in these systems, the people are the parts. And that's why that fact that the CHO knew by name every ASHA, and they knew each other, and they smiled when they talked to each other. How do you measure that? So it's, yes, it's the money, and if you don't provide it, it's not there. And Yayushman Bharat and the commitment has significantly increased the funds. India still has uh, a low level of GDP committed to healthcare compared to others. The second is the building now on a sound system design. And then the third is being able to see whether you're delivering on that design at, a lo at the local level that people can understand it. One missing element here is with 70% of people accessing the primary health, the private healthcare sector, it's unclear what the relationship needs to be. There's increasing certification and QAS. There is increasing connection between the public and the private. In TB, we, I'm learning that the private is expected to notify about TB. They are supported by the public to enable the, their patient to have nutrition subsidies and some supervision of the care but they continue to take care of it. They're not taking the patient away from, from them. Again, it's creating that relationship with the primary care at the private sector that builds the closure and the gaps. So I think those are the critical elements. The information technology is just a means to that end. An app is not gonna create the relationship, it's not gonna save the day. But the app, if it is used by the clinicians, can connect the dots. And so when Rashmi put the information in, the alert was actually listened to by the DHO. And actions were prompted to create a connection and a phone call that followed after. That's more, more important than the technology. But again, like money, the technology can help when the system is designed to function that way.
Thank you, sir. We'll have one more question. Uh, Just one question. First of all, uh, uh, Dr. Kamande, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, your books were uh, the source of inspiration that inspired me to become a doctor in the first place. So uh, great to see you here. My question is that uh, we have seen that uh, that is primary health care, which results in improvement in survival. Uh, but uh, for a lot of doctors, especially here in India, the incentive is lacking to reach to the primary healthcare centers in the first place. So with your uh, experience in Thailand and other countries, is it possible, and which probably our government also has been trying to do, can alternate health practitioners be integrated and can they contribute to improving the healthcare? Or that's just a far-fetched dream or a pipe dream? It was echoing and it was a little hard for me to pick up the, the Incentives? Yeah. Okay. Integration. And inter integration. Got it. Yeah. Okay. The, um, so when you talk to an economist, they always want to talk about the payment incentives to make things happen. And we have some powerful examples in India of payment incentives that the world has learned about, such as uh, the payments when a mother delivers at a health facility instead of at the home. And that accelerated the uh, ability to get people to, to uh, have skilled birth attendants. The, the thing that I would say is there have been many studies of payment incentives and they have, a, they have power, they can make a difference, they can be gamed, and we've seen the corruption problems and other things that can happen in that space. And, uh, and over time, the gain for the amount of money can be modest. The driver ultimately that, uh, so it was an accelerant, but the true thing that has made it so 90% now, more, more than 90% are coming to the facilities is that there is respectful care. They're not abused, <laughs> um, which was, uh, was not, were not uncommon, that the quality has improved. They see the benefits of coming into the system and in fact, now many are bypassing the primary health birth centers, which have very modest resources, and going to the community health centers and the district hospitals for delivery, where they have blood transfusion, where they have C-section capability if something goes wrong. And those are dramatically improving the results. So the most important incentive is people go when they see the services are there and that they can trust them. If they go once and the clinician is missing, or the clinician is missing, but they are not able to provide the medication, or they are providing medication but don't seem to know or provide with a proper quality, those are the things that lead people to say, I'm not gonna go there. And that's why I was fascinated and increasingly used this as the measure in my mind, do men go for the care? <laughs> You know, you will have health-seeking behavior if there is benefit. Uh, you will see that they will show up at that primary health center, and that means those NCDs are starting to be provided for. Um, but I think incentives play a role, but in all of the countries where we are seeing these levels get to 80 uh, years, none of them are providing significant incentives to make you go. They are doing it by appropriate care, enough health workers, and good relationships so people are not forgotten and left at home without, without being touched and, uh, and recognize they have needs that they may not even realize that health center can help with. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you for the talk, Dr. Gawande. I'm, uh, I'm here. Uh, I'm a surgeon and a fan of the checklist manifesto to the extent that I have a picture of the cover on a number of talks that I do. Uh, taking it from there, do you think we can dumb down what we need to do for each nation or for each region into checklists? Do you think it's easier to just make checklists for what people need to do? And that might just be a simpler way of ensuring that it gets done. So I made my name on, uh, on, on, a, on checklists and, uh, um, and the importance. I became fascinated with checklists because they are the simplest system that human beings invented for being able to work together in a reliable way. And it transformed industries like aviation that um, had a checklist in place. But I will also be the first to say it's not the answer to everything. <laughs> uh, 
you do need to be able to distill what is the recipe for the best result. And, and then be able to make that recipe a simple enough protocol with a job aid that people aren't memorizing it, but can make sure the critical steps are happening on a regular basis. And so it's not enough to be able to tell the, have the textbook or the guidance that's a book this thick. Today we released the guidance on infection prevention and control and, toxic, uh, and, uh, and managing biomedical waste. And it will reach hundreds of people. But the three job aids, the four job aids that were made on how to manage that waste, you can see in one glance what the, th what the life saving measures are. You can see the key steps for infection prevention and control. Those will be managed and used by tens of thousands. It is not just going to happen because some person is looking at the checklist. There is also a supervisor or a manager that is providing supportive supervision on a periodic basis to ask, are we following this? Are we following the key protocols that save lives? And someone thinking about whether there are too many checklists. You have to make sure that it's designed in such a way that people can use them and they're not overloaded with expectation. So I do think they play a critical role. They help guide uh, supervisors and leaders to understand what are the critical steps that they must pay attention to. It helps guide the frontline team to understand what the key steps are along the way. Uh, but again, I go back to uh, it is the simplest form of a system. Sometimes it can be an information technology tool. Uh, sometimes it may be a colleague who joins you in, in uh, reinforcing the practices that, that are done. Those are what are driving um, remarkable improvements already in India. Thank you so much, sir. May I request our director, sir, to kindly present a memento to Dr. Atul Gawande as a symbol of our immense gratitude and appreciation for his valuable contribution and the insights he had shared with us today. I would like to request Ms. Michelle M. Lang, Director, Office of Health at USAID India, to propose the vote of thanks. So as we wrap up today, uh, I want to extend a sincere thank you to all of you for joining us today for Dr. Atul's uh, lecture. So of course, first I want to thank those of uh, you that joined us on stage. Uh, Professor Dr. M. Srinivas, Director of Ames, New Delhi, and Professor Dr. K.K. Berma, the Dean of Academics, and we met with you um, a few weeks ago and proposed this idea of uh, allowing Dr. Atul to come back to Ames to give a lecture. And I just want to say thank you so much for this is, we kept saying, this is the cherry on the cake of Dr. Atul's visit and uh, really appreciate the cooperation. I know you're having a big event and thank you for squeezing us in. And it's been a real pleasure this afternoon. Um, of course, I want to express sincere thank you to Dr. Atul 
Gwande, our Assistant Administrator of the Global Health Bureau at USAID. And if I can just take two seconds to say thank you for coming to the USAID India and to see the work that we're doing in the field. You provided incredible insights, guidance, direction, and uh, we're excited to take a lot of your vision forward as we move forward. So thank you. Of course, quickly, I'm going to say thank you to all those who work tirelessly behind the scenes to help set this up. Uh, there's, of course, too many to thank, um, but everyone from the Ames Department of Hospital Administration, of course, our own team from USAID, and uh, the team from Chapai Govind Rice, thank you so much for all that you did to make this happen. So just lastly, just to say that USAID, along with all of our sister agencies in the US government, the Centers for Disease Control, Health and Human Services, and uh, NIH, uh, we're all very um, honored and humbled uh, to work with an organization as prestigious and respected as AIMS. Um, by working together, we are really advancing innovations that will improve the health and livelihoods not only of Indians and the American people, but also the ability to move the needle on health outcomes globally. Um, so we really look forward to continuing and building our partnership with you all. So thank you again, and I'll just wish you all a very happy holy, and thank you. That sums up our session. I may request everyone to kindly proceed for the refreshments available on the second floor cafeteria and on the first floor jail auditorium. Thank you all for your presence and participation today.